Kind of crazy. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know me, my name is Michael Gross. A uh, special welcome if you guys are joining us online. Um, we, are, we are in the midst of a series called Forged by Fire, and the whole focus on this thing is discipleship. And um, I, was, uh, I was reminded of, of what discipleship really looks like this past week when when I heard a story about a man, he was simply known as Dr. John, this, this quiet, calm physician who mentored kids in, in Kung Fu. He found time between, between patient appointments to encourage his, his, his people to, to, to learn self-defense. He was concerned for his people. Now, this, this guy was 52 year, two years old. He was married, has two kids. On a typical Sunday, you'd find him worshiping at his home church, Kingdom Covenant Church in this little town in California. But last Sunday was different. Last Sunday, he, uh, he ended up taking his mom to her church. You see, she, um, she stopped going to church a few months ago because her husband died. And so she was really grieving grieving that loss. And so he texted his pastor, Ira Augustine, and said, hey, I'm, I'm taking my mom to her church. The, the former pastor has come back and, and they're going to have this little luncheon for him. And so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be there. And around 1 p.m., Pastor Augustine, he replied back to Chang's text and he said, hey, say hi to your mother for me. You are such a good son. And Chang just responded, I can always be better. I can always be better. Well, it was less than 15 minutes after that, that this man who is described as unfathomably kind, Zhang Chang, he didn't hesitate when a gunman pulled out his weapon in this little luncheon and started firing at the people who were there. Prosecutors say that the gunman, his name was David Chow, he spent about an hour with the attendees at the luncheon, apparently to gain their trust so he could ex execute his, pop, his plot. The day before, he had chained doors, he had glued locks, he, he brought with him two 9mm handguns and three bags containing Molotov, cocktails, bombs, ammunition. But when the, when the shooting began, Chang just charged this man. And he was shot. He died at the scene. But his quick action, it, disrupt, it disrupted the shooter who was, who was then hit by a chair, thrown by somebody else. And three members then jumped on this guy and they hogtied him with electrical wire. Dr. John was the only one who died that day. Sheriff Don Barnes called him heroic. He said this was, this was a good versus evil situation. And it was preparedness combined with Chang's disposition that gave him the bias to act in that situation. Because most people, we dream about acting, but most of us just freeze. See, people don't rise to the level of the occasion. They fall to the level of their training. Authorities credit Chang's quick action with saving dozens of lives. Last Sunday, His pastor said, evil didn't take Dr. John out. Dr. John chose to lay down his life so that others could live. Man, when I heard this story, a lot of you heard about the story, but then I kind of dug into this guy. I was so moved. And so I, I, I shared the story with my son, Noah, and his immediate response was, well, that's exactly how we should live. That's what a disciple of Jesus looks like. Someone who is prepared and ready to act on whatever comes our way. Friends, we're talking about discipleship because it's the core of who we are. Because we should be prepared to act as followers of Jesus in every and any situation that comes our way. Last week, we, we described a disciple as somebody who, is, who follows Jesus, who is changed by Jesus, and who is committed to the mission of Jesus. And so, so we do the difficult and time-consuming task of developing this intimate relationship with Jesus 
by, by practicing our, our spiritual disciplines and consistently spending time in Scripture, by being still in the presence of our God, by learning how to hear His voice so that, so that we can be used as a tool for good in a world that is spinning out of control. And we do this all for the glory of our King. This is what it means to be a disciple in church. You need to understand, this is the only reason we exist. To make disciples who make disciples of Jesus for His glory. I want to dig into this deeper today. So if you have your Bibles... I'm going to ask you to open up to the book of Ephesians. This is Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. And we have been walking through this. And we're going to walk through all six chapters uh, of uh, of this short letter. We're going to look really intently at verses 14 through 19 in, in, in uh, in this chapter. Now for those of you guys who are joining us for the very first time, let me... And maybe, maybe as a reminder to all of us, let me, let me bring you up to speed as to where we have been. So that, that first week on, in, in the series, and really for these first three chapters, Paul is laying out who we are. It's not a list of to-dos. It's just, this is who you are. Because of what Jesus has done, this is, this is who you are. He focuses on identity. This is foundational for us. And, and Paul tells us that if we, if we surrender our lives to Jesus, then we are adopted, we are redeemed, and we are sealed. This is really good news. And so three weeks ago, I had you guys say this out loud. I'm going to ask you to do it again right now. And if you're watching, say this out loud with me. Just say, I am adopted. I am redeemed. I am sealed. This is who you are in Christ. This is amazing, right? And then last week, Paul kind of put a damper on that, right? He, he, he said that apart from Jesus, we're dead. And he said, all of us are dead. We all know what it is to be dead. But God. And then he adds that. He says, but God. Because of the love that God has for you, he extended grace to us. This, this free gift of forgiveness and an invitation to be a part of his family for it is, it is by grace you have been saved. This is, this is really good. Paul is building a foundation for a disciple. This is, this is who you are. This is what God has done. Live in this and, and live out of this. This reality which God has forged. So that's where we've been. And now Paul takes us another step today. This is so good. Um, so uh, hold, hold your, your spot on chapter 3 and then I'm just going gonna, gonna to pray and invite, invite God in to our time. Maybe calm us and get our minds straight. Heavenly Father, <laughs> I just need to pray for this this family of, of John Chang and thank you for um, for people like that who live out their faith even in the face of death encourage that family fill them Lord with your hope with the fullness of who you are And God, today as we talk about what it is to be a disciple, Lord, I pray that this is more than just a theoretical exercise for us. But we understand, Lord, who you are. And we understand why we're here. That we're not just bystanders on this planet, God. You have a purpose and a plan for us to bring you glory, to love well, to live in your, your beauty, your radiance, your grace. Teach us, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3. Starting in verse 14. And so, 
<clears throat> so Paul, in the, in the first few verses of this chapter, he's, he's laying out that there has been a secret that no one has known, but, but now the secret is out. The secret's revealed, and the secret is simply this. That, that the Gentiles, non-Jews, are now welcome to be a part of the kingdom of God. This has been God's plan all along, but nobody ever knew it. But because of Jesus, this is now a reality. So all are welcome into the kingdom through Jesus Christ. But then Paul presses in and he says, but you guys need to do some real heart work. There's this inner this inner work that needs to take place. And this is his focus. Starting in verse 14, 14, we read, For this reason I kneel, this is Paul, For this reason I kneel before the Father, he's talking about God, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named. I pray that according to the wealth of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner person. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith so that because you have been rooted and grounded in love, you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and thus to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled, you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. So this passage is all about the Spirit of God working in and through your life. Now oftentimes we think of the Holy Spirit, you know, we, we, we think about these, these supernatural things that happen through the power of the Holy Spirit. Like, like people speaking in, in a different tongue or, or, or a healing happening or, or maybe a, a word of God being given to you that, that changes the trajectory of your life. But here, Paul is talking about something different. He's talking about the Holy Spirit strengthening our inner person. A a strength that he gives us so that we can know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. This, This infinite understanding of Jesus, so that we could be filled with all the fullness of God. And so so the goal here of of Paul's prayer is, is clear. He wants you, he's specifically writing to the church in Ephesus, which which transfers to us. He wants us to be filled with all the fullness of God. And that that sounds great. I mean, who who doesn't want that? I mean, it's it's not like we want to be empty. That's not the prayer that we, we want to be filled with God. And, And oftentimes we feel so much less than that, Especially when we play the comparison game and we see people's best, right? And we say, oh man, look at that person is certainly filled with the Spirit of God. In this passage, Paul ends with those words. I'm praying so that you may be filled. The focus, the, the purpose of his prayer is that, is that each one of us, the, the listener, the, the reader, the disciple may be full we be filled with the fullness of God. And I want you to check out the progression here that, that Paul leads us, leads us through. He, he starts with humility as he bows before God. Why? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Why? So that you may be rooted and grounded in love. Why? So that you can know the love of Christ. Why? So that you become a tour. Complete, filled with the fullness of Christ. Paul is dealing with, with the inside. This is the heart of the matter. He's, he's not talking about symptoms. He's, he's done with the byproducts. He's going to the very heart of the matter. Like, like right now, there are a few people in my family who whose immune systems are getting their butts kicked right now by this onslaught of airborne pollen, right? The other day, I'm I'm eyeing this this beautifully, fully bloomed palm tree, and I lean over to my wife, and I just say, man, that is is beautiful. And she simply turns to me, and she says, cut it down. (laughs) 
You know, and, and now that might be, not be a direct quote, but I, I could see it in her, her half shut, slightly puffy, I can't stop itching these eyes, you know. So, so we can try to treat the symptoms, and we do. Claritin and Allertec and Flonase and Sudafed and Benadryl, you name it, we have, we have tried it. But what really needs to happen is she needs to stay in the house like every day, all day, for the next month or so as this whole pollen thing works itself out. And as a little side note, all you no mo may people, you may be saving a few honeybees, but you are causing my wife undue harm. So mow your grass, okay? Just, just get it done. As a pastor, it's, it's easy to look at the external issues, right? And, and ask questions. I mean, why, 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 don't, why don't we serve more? Right? Why, why, don't, why, don't, why don't God's people give more? Why are we more generous? Why don't we actually love our neighbors? Because we talk about it. Why, why don't we do that? Why don't we share our faith more? Why do you keep looking at pornography? Why can't you guys just, just get along? Why are you always fighting in your marriage? Why are you holding on to, to all your stuff? And why are you so greedy that you just keep wanting more and more and more and more? But that's, not, that's not the heart. Of the issue. Those are just symptoms. See, the, the real issue is about intimacy. Most of us don't grasp the depth of God's love. Do, do you understand who loves you and, and how much He loves you? Because if you understood so that, I mean, you, you, would, you would look at your possessions and you would say, I, I don't really need that. I don't really care about that. That's not, that doesn't change my life. You look at someone who hurt you and you'd say, I will forgive you. Again. I'll forgive you. This is what Paul prays for. He says, I'm praying for your inner person. Not, not these external things. Not, not, not the physical things. Not the symptoms. But the very core of your being. Because if you really understood the love of Christ, the love that he has for you, you would, with great joy, sell all your possessions. You'd give it to the poor. You'd just follow after Jesus. Where do I go, Jesus? See, it's not that in our, in our brains, we don't, we don't get that. Okay, God is good. I, I get it. God is good. Sometimes I, but I get it. God is God is good. We, we just don't grasp how, how good God really is, right? How, how wide and how long and how high and how deep is his love for us. We, we get it just a little bit, and so we, we follow after Jesus just, just a little bit. But if we, if we fully understood God's goodness, it would change us. And that, friends, is the miracle that Paul is praying for. Not a miracle of physical healing, but a, but a miracle of heart healing. That you would understand the love God has for you. See, Paul prays because he's at that place. It's a really good place. A place of understanding that, that he can't actually change that in you. He can't physically bring about this, this kind of understanding and I get this because as a pastor, I, I carry that weight with me far too often. This, this idea that, that I can make you fall in love with Jesus. I can, I can make my kids or, or my wife love Jesus even more. If I, if, I just, if I just preach a little better, if maybe if I can just have some one-on-one -on -one time with you and just, just say it the right way, then, you, then you're going to fall in love with Jesus. But, but I'm learning from Paul that, that what I need to do, what we need to do, is, is, is spend more time on our knees asking that God would strengthen you in his power, in your inner being, that you might know the depth of God's love for you. See, Paul says that he, he, he bows to his knees. Now, now uh, that's, that's not typical for, for a, a Jewish person. Typically, the typical stance is, is to pray standing up. But Paul, but Paul takes this this position of humility, and he, and he bows before his father. He says, I, I, I surrender. Who, who am I in, in front of the king? You are almighty God, and I am, I am nothing in your presence. This is the position that Paul takes. He bows on our behalf. He bows before the creator of everyone, before the one who has saved us and given us his name, little Christ's. 
And he prays, according to the wealth of his glory, that God may grant you to be strengthened. It's, and it's that word, that word grant, that I want you to pay attention to here. Because he's saying that no matter how hard he works, he can't make you or I understand the love of Jesus. God has to do that supernaturally through the power of his Holy Spirit. And when he does that, when he grants that to you, something changes in our inner being. Now, now we might waver in and out of that understanding, but the Holy Spirit keeps, keeps pushing it in front of us. This is the truth of who God is. This is the, the truth and the depth of his love over you. When we understand this is, this is granted to us. And that granting happens through prayer. Prayer. Being still in the presence of God. And, and so, so that practically means that, that in this moment, it, as we're talking about Jesus and, and you're just looking at this and you're shaking your head and you're, you're skeptical, I, I can't do anything about that in this moment. I don't have that kind of power. This is something that God has to do. And this is why Paul gets on his knees. Now my wife and I, we, uh, we love to have people over to our, our home, right? We, now, my wife, she'll, she'll offer you something that you really love and you want to come back for. But I, I will offer you one of my top shelf fruit smoothie protein shakes. <laughs> right, now, now you, might, you might balk at the sewage water color or, or maybe the, the thought that there's spinach and avocado and carrots and blueberries and hemp parts, chocolate protein, all mixed together in, in a delightful cup. But I'll, I'll be honest with you, most people, when they see it, they don't ask for a whole cup. They oblige me, and they, they, they take a little sip, and rarely will somebody say, hey, would you fill that to the top? Although, I am telling you, it is fantastic, and you will love it, and it will love you. It will change, it will change so much about you. But I, I can't make you love it. I can't make you love it. And this is the same thing that Paul is implying to us in this passage. He's saying, I can't make you fall in love with Jesus. Right? I, I, I can make the introduction. Like, like, I can do this too. Like, you walk into this room and I can tell you about who God is. And he's, he's the creator of the universe. The only one who matters. He, he loves you so deeply. More than your wife can love you. More than your husband can love you. More than your parents can love you. Or your friends can love you. He's crazy about you. He loves you so much that he gave his one and only son. While you were still a sinner. Well, you were rebelling against him. And in the midst of that, he gave his son for you. This is the depth of our God's love. And, and, and picture this, the father watching his son being crucified on a cross. What, what kind of love is that? And then the son rises from the grave after being buried for three days. And he gets up by the power of the spirit and he ascends back into heaven. And now, now he puts that spirit inside of us. This is our amazing God. Some of you, you hear that message and you're just like, hmm, okay. I mean, if that, if that works for you, that's, that's great. I can make the introduction, but Nothing will happen inside of you unless the Spirit of God is working in your life. Giving you the strength to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. And, and, and He lets you know something that you otherwise can't know. When you get to this point and, and you understand, you go, okay, now I, I get it. I get how He loves me. And so I, I, I pray this. I'm learning to pray this, that you would understand the love of God and that you would love God more than you love your sin. You, you realize, maybe, maybe you haven't thought about this, 
But there is never, never in the history of the earth has, has there been a, a spirit-filled couple that has been divorced. Never. So the, so the issue isn't about his needs or, or her needs. The issue isn't about, about love language. The issue is that, that somehow as, as individuals, we haven't understood the love of Christ, the love that Jesus has for us. You haven't been filled with that love. That's, that's why you start fighting and arguing because you're expecting this other person to fill this in you, this, this, this need that you have that no one else can fill except for Christ. It all goes back to the core issue. Think about this. I've, I've wasted so many hours counseling couples when the issue really isn't about the marriage. The issue is this lack of understanding the love of God. This love that pass, surpasses all knowledge. And so many of you, you, you spend all kinds of time looking at the outer man or, or the outer woman, trying to fix it up, trying to make it look just, just right. But how much time do you spend on the inner man? Or the, the inner woman praying for your soul? That, that God would open your eyes to his love. Let me ask you a question. And you don't, don't, don't answer this one too quickly. Just between you and God, are, are you sure right now that Jesus Christ is crazy about you? Are you 100% sure that, not that he loves everybody else in the world, but that he loves you? He loves you. That you, you, you can say that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that, that Jesus is crazy about me. Or is there something in you that, that's saying, I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I, I want that to be true. I've been, I've been told that my whole life, but I, I don't really know that. Now, now, maybe you can't answer that question. Maybe. So let, let me give you a different one. This one will be a little bit easier. How much, how much do you think God the Father loves the Son? How would you describe that kind of love? I mean, pretty perfect, right? I mean, like, like infinite, like a, like a whole lot. That's why John 59, this is a difficult passage for many of us to embrace. Because this, this is what the gospel writer says. That just as the Father has loved me, this is Jesus talking, just as the Father has loved me, I also loved you. So remain in that love. Did you, did you catch what that means for you? In the same way that the Father loves the Son, Jesus says, that's how much I love you you. Now, now I think we read that and we say, hold on, hold on, I think there might be a little typo in there because what I'm thinking it should say is just, just as the Father has loved the Son, if you, if you cut that in half, you maybe divide by three, subtract a hundred, like, like that's how much, that's how much maybe Jesus should love me. But that's not what it says. As the Father has loved the Son, so, so I love you. Now some of you get that. Some of you live in that and and I am so thankful for you. I, I learn from you. But some of you struggle with this verse. And you say, no way, that, that's, 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 that's too much. As, as much as the Father loves the Son. See, that's why, that's why this kind of knowledge, it doesn't come from just working really hard. It comes because the Spirit, Spirit moves in you, strengthens you. Something has to happen through the power of the Holy Spirit in order for me or you to understand that kind of love. I've had so many people talk to me and, and, and they ask, how, how can I help my husband or how can I help my wife or how can I help my child know this kind of love? And the answer is you can't. But you can pray. Just like Paul. See, I love how practical Paul is in this letter he, he lays out what it looks like to, to follow Jesus, right? To be a disciple. To think about the way he starts this whole thing out. There, there, there's, there's not this list of to-dos or, or should-have-dones. 
He tells us who we are. You need to be reminded that you are adopted, you are redeemed, that you are sealed. And he tells us what God has done for us, that he did this. We didn't do it. He did it. We were dead in our sin. But God, by grace you have been saved through faith. And then he prays that we might comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and thus to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. See, I am convinced of this, that your ability to love others is directly proportional to your intimacy with God. When you know God's love, when you experience the depth of God's love, when God awakens you to his love, granting you strength in your inner person, that love changes everything. See, when you know the love of Jesus, then you can love in return. When you know the love of Jesus, you can extend forgiveness without condition because your inner person is strong. When you, when you love Jesus, when you know the love of Jesus, you can say, I'm, I'm sorry. Because your, your identity is wrapped up in the person of Jesus, not pretending to be perfect. When you know the love of Jesus, you can run towards someone who has a loaded gun in their hand, giving your life for the sake of others, because you know that this world is not your home. Your world is found in the breadth and the length and the height and the width of the love of Jesus. Your ability to love others is directly proportional to your intimacy with God. So I want, I want you to know that I'm, I'm still learning and uh, I... I am going to be praying for you in these weeks to come. And I ask that you would also pray for me. That the Holy Spirit would fill me up. And would give me a deeper security of the love that God has for me. And I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for your, your inner man or your, your inner woman. That you would be strengthened. So that you would really understand this great love. See what I know is, is some of you who are here this morning. Or maybe you're, you're watching online you're feeling pretty insecure about that love. You don't know where you are with God right now and you certainly don't understand the depth of God's love for you. You, you need prayer. You, you need to pray for yourself. You need people to be praying for you. And so I invite you, I invite you to ask for prayer. Prayer. We're, we're going to be praying for something supernatural to happen. Because that's the only chance that we have. That God would grant you through the riches of his glory to know this love of Jesus. Now some of you, some of you have, you have friends, you have co-workers, you have family members that you care about very deeply. And you know that there's an emptiness in their lives because they don't understand the love of Christ. And you've, you've been treating the symptoms. I mean, you've, you've been doing everything that you know to do. Encouraging them to, 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 to step away from the lifestyle that they're, they're embracing. To, to, to get off drugs. To, to, be, to be less greedy. To quit worrying about the future. But the bottom lines are these aren't the real issue. The issue is something supernatural. They, they need their hearts to be changed. Just like in the book of Ezekiel when, when it said that they have a heart of stoning. And God gave them a heart of flesh, a new heart. They need the love of Jesus. And so I'm going to invite you, as we move into a time of worship, I'm going to invite you to pray. So I want to do this a little different. I mean, typically when we pray, you're just sitting in your seats and it's all good. Um, today I'm going to ask you to kneel. And I get it. That's a cement floor. I know, I know. And maybe it's not possible for all of you to kneel. But I'm going to ask that in these moments that, that you ask God to put someone's name or maybe it's a few people's names on your heart and that in this moment you would take the position of Paul and you would kneel 
And, that you, and you would pray for that person that their inner being would be strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit so that they would, they would, be, un, they would be able to understand the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge so that they would experience the fullness of God. The fullness of God. Intimacy with God. 